Hello everyone again. Um, this week we will be focusing on some uh, practical questions. We have um, started our um, MATLAB study last week. So this week we will be looking at some examples now. Um, let's right dive in. Uh, the first question is, actually all the questions are not really that difficult, but they are just for uh, examples. So now um, let's define an X. Uh, if X is true, display true, else display false and end. Now the request is to rewrite this code without using else. Um, and it's quite uh, easy, I'd say. There we go. Now let's say x is true and fx then display true, else, and let's display false. Now, um, if you don't want to use the um, else statement here, since this is just if it's equal to true, or you can also maybe write it down like that, um, or you can just omit that because it just checks if it's true or not. So let's first of all run this. Um, as you can see, it displayed true, so it works. Now. Um, you don't really have to put true here, but if you do, it'll do the same job. So no problem there. Now, what we want to do is we want to split this if else statement here. We want to get rid of that. And of course, this part here remains the same because if it's true, we want to display true. But what do we have to do in order to display false if in case X is equal to false? Now, in order to do that, of course, we need to take the Boolean inverse or the logical inverse here, which is the not operation. And if you are familiar with other programming languages, there are lots of different ways of taking the inverse logically. But here in MATLAB, we use this tilde uh, sign here instead of using the exclamation, for example. In C, we use if not equal to uh, in this sense. So if this would be the C version here, or if X is not equal to true, would be the statement that we would write down. But here, instead of exclamation point, we have actually the tilde sign. So basically, this would be the code. And if we run it, if we equate this to false, I have to run it twice. You can see it takes effect and it is false. Now, it is called branching in programming. Uh, if you use if statements, you are basically branching here. And uh, what it really does is, uh, for example, this code is actually removed from the uh, execution here because this is false. Uh, actually, if this is true, if this is set to true, then the inverse of that is false. And if you write down if false like this, this code, this piece of code here will never be executed because it is not possible to make this somehow equal to true. Uh, for that reason, if I, for example, write down something like this, then actually I'm not re uh, really writing uh, an if statement because if true will always be satisfied and line five and seven can be just erased. It would be the same. So we're kind of controlling this if a piece of code should be executed or not based on conditions like here. And these conditions uh, might be more complicated. Let's, for example, say that we have something else like X and Y are true. And let's say X and Y then display true. Let's see. So let me just clear, run. There we go. Uh, by the way, you can again 
x equals equals true and operation y equals equals true but you don't really have to do it because these are already boolean values so you can just uh, use them as they are and since this is basically this translates into true should be these two true statements or booleans will be uh, used as an end operation and as a result this whole thing here will be equal to true and therefore this if statement will work so what about now what would be write down if we have this as an example so if i want to replace this else with uh, an if statement or multiple if statements what would i do well here it gets a, it gets a bit more complicated because we have two conditions which are bind together with an end operation so they should be satisfied simultaneously um and the inverse of that so we are looking at the inverse the not operation of this because we should write down basically this sort of if you're lazy you can do that if you are lazy enough you can just do this here or we can also think about it and come up with it or if you know some uh, logic you can just apply it here uh, whichever you want now if one of them is false for example x if x is not equal to true but we still have y equal uh, to true so i'm talking about this statement here uh, this is one possibility so this is not uh, the condition this would not be uh, satisfied so if this is true this becomes false false and true becomes false now there's another uh, option that would be this one here so if x is satisfied okay x should be equal to true but y is not satisfied, then we have, again, a problem, an issue, and it would not display, it should not display true. And we also have this possibility here. So if x is not satisfied and y is not satisfied, we could have this one too. So therefore, if I'm going to bind them, if I want to combine them, I can also use individual ifs. Or I can just take the operation uh, or operation here and say if one of these cases appear. So let me just copy this part too. If one of these cases appear, then display false. So this would be an equivalent of this code. This one is much simpler, but what I'm trying to say is that the else operation includes actually all these cases here so there are not uh, actually two there are three uh, different possibilities here that are addressed with the same code because we don't really care about the details at this point if you care about the details then what you can do is you can just use else if and pick one of these uh, possible outcomes here for example i could just take this one here use it uh, in an else if then use an else uh, and if I do this, what I'm getting here is basically these cases correspond to else operation. So usually, uh, if you add one more uh, else, if you can just let uh, else take care of the rest, and you have addressed all different possibilities and outcomes in terms of your conditions. So uh, basically, if you know how to use an if statement, you can always use if else if else you don't really have to use them but you can go ahead and use them because they make life easier because this one here looks way more cleaner than this one because this is a bit more messy but this is actually what behind the scenes happens so that's that for this example what else well uh, again we have an interesting thing going on here um x is equal to 23 and if x is greater than or equal to 20 we will display that and if it's not we will display less than 20 but the problem here is that we are requested to write this code with a while block so that's a bit interesting 
So uh, if x is greater than or equal to 20, display x is greater than or equal to 20. So that's the uh, message that's, that we want to display. And else we want to display x is less than 20. There we go. And we are testing it with 23. X is greater than or equal to 20. Nice. Of course, if we take a lesser number, it will still work. But the request here is to replace this code in such a way that we are using only while loop. So how can we do that? Or why should we even do that? Well, the reasoning here is actually trivial. It's just trying to make a point. It doesn't make sense to try to write this code with a while loop, of course, but it, it tries to point out something, so we'll see. So, um, yeah, let's try to uh, start like the same here. While x is tw uh, less than or uh, greater than or equal to 20, let's display this. And then there's this end block, and we're basically done. But of course, this would not give the same result because x is not changing. So therefore, it will re-enter this loop, and it will go on forever. So basically, we might introduce a new variable, for example. Let's say x c and equate it to that and if this new variable is greater than or equal to 20 it corresponds to the actual condition so no problem there but once we are done with that we can maybe set it equal to a different value for example let's say um 21 if I do this, what uh, really is going to happen is that it will break the loop. So I'm trying to basically uh, break the loop here. Uh, and 21 will not, uh, oh, it's, it still does satisfy, by the way. 19 would be the right thing here because 19 greater than or equal to 20 uh, will not be satisfied. So we will get out of the loop. But what if, it is already a lesser number. Let's say it is already 19. Then it will not enter this while loop because x uh, c is not uh, or 19 is not greater than or equal to 20. In that case, this will not never work. So we have covered this part, but we also need the else part here. So what we again can do is reassign it to uh, x. That's the reason why I've defined a dummy variable here and I can repeat this for the inverse condition meaning that xc should be less than there we go now if it satisfies this condition it will enter this while loop it will display x is less than 20 but then if it's still 19 it will return here it still satisfies and it will go on forever so it will be an infinite loop. So in order to break that, what we can do is we can just, even 20 would be sufficient here. We, we, will, we would just break out of the loop and that's going to be it. So let's see. Of course, this is obvious. So I'm going to comment it out. So it seems to be working. Let's try a different value. There we go it's less than 20, it works. So why do we actually need something like this? Uh, or what is it trying to say? Uh, is basically while loops are almost the same as if loops, uh, if conditions, I'm sorry, but they repeat. The difference is that this condition is checked and based on that, this part here is executed. But the problem here is that it jumps back to this the condition checking and if it's still satisfying the condition it will go on forever so until the condition is somehow uh, violated so if it's not violating therefore you should be careful of that uh, if it will never stop 
And I can demonstrate that with a different piece of, by the way, if we don't really have to use this, we can just say break. And also here we can use break. So let's try that out. So you don't really have to reassign stuff. X is greater than or equal to that. So 19. It is less than. Therefore, you don't also really need the dummy variable here. You can just go ahead and say, okay, if X is that, if X is that, there we go. So you can see it still works. And now it seems to be more like an if statement because we have a condition. It will be checked one time and we are at, at the end of the block. And that's it, basically. So that's basically it. But now I'm going to show you a different example where we use the if block itself in order to generate the while block. Maybe that would also make sense uh, in order to demonstrate this fact. So let's say x is equal to 1. Uh, let's count up to 5. And let's display x, nothing else. And let's increase x equals x plus one. So we increase this. So if I run this, you'll see nothing really happens. We just display one. And that's basically it. But what happens if I copy this numerous times? So let's copy and paste it. And let's run it. So now you can see that basically, even though we have more than five if blocks here, I don't know how many I've copies, copied and pasted, but we can see we have quite a lot of if blocks. But what really happens is the following. X is equal to one. It is less than five. Therefore, it gets displayed. It is increased one. It becomes two. Two is still less than five or equal to. It is displayed and increment in three. Four. At this point, five still satisfies this, but here it becomes six. And therefore, from now on, all these if blocks here are not really necessary because none of them get executed because six is not less than or equal to five. Therefore, it doesn't really exist at this point. These if blocks will actually not be executed because each time this comparison returns false, this will be jumped. So our execution jumps to this end, to this one, to this one, to this one, until it is done with the whole program here. So we don't really have to add these uh, uh, at some point. But if it's a uh, larger number, then we need more if blocks. Of course, this is not the way of doing things. What we need to do is if we want to repeat them until the statement is violated or broken, you just, you just used the while loop here. So it's a uh, looping if block. So if you execute it, you can see it still works and it is basically the same. So that's about this. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Yeah, I kind of have um, uh, almost mentioned uh, this third question here. But uh, there are still some things to say about it. Now, let's say that um, so coin is equal to yy, and if the first coin is equal to uh, actually. Let's say heads, heads, if it's heads or tails. So if this is the case, then display just heads, heads. Now, in these types of situations, we most of the time like to use else if, uh, not to mess up the uh, conditions here. So if that's, for example, if the second coin is tails, and then this one could be tails, the other one could be heads, 
There we go. And well, we could do something like this if both are tails. And we could display unexpected events or something like that. Now, if you're coding it like this, it means that you are trying to display an error message for uh, some reason, because if it's not uh, head, head or tails, if it's, for example, a number or any other character, then you are just displaying this unexpected event. But if you're not really caring about the error part here, what you can do is you can be lazy and just use this instead of coding the whole else if here. So it depends really as a good programming practice. I wouldn't say that this is the, an ideal way of doing things, but yeah, it's just to demonstrate and to be lazy, it's possible. So this is our code. And what we want to do is we want to only use if blocks in order to do the same thing here. Now, of course, let me just bring back this else if here. I'm going to use it. Of course, the first that comes to mind if you ask me, of course, is to, uh, this one actually, just uh, turn them into individual if blocks. That's one way of doing things. So I can just discreetly analyze each uh, case and just write if blocks, and that would be one way of doing it. So let's just run this code. There we go. If it's HH, it is hats and hats, and you can change it. And it should be working. There we go. It's not that complicated, of course, if we are expecting it to work. Now, this is not the only solution that we can come up with. So there's another solution, which is called nested ifs. And the reason for that is the following. What we do is instead of checking each, uh, instead of checking both coins simultaneously, what we can do is we can pick the first one, check it first, and then check the second one and display this message. And by that, I mean the following. We can go ahead and copy this, get rid of the second part here, and of course not display anything at this point. There are only two possibilities here. So let me just first use else uh, and then convert it into something else. So the coin one has two possibilities. One of them could be H, the other one is obviously tails. And if you want to be more specific or fail safe, what you can do is you can maybe use it like this and then place else. That's one way of dealing with stuff, but yeah. At the moment, I'm just going to stick with this. Now, if I check the first coin, what I can do now is I can be interested in the next coin inside of this if, because I did get rid of the first coin. Now I'm interested in the second part. And if it's one of the two possibilities, I'm going to display the message that is needed to be displayed. So coin two, if that's also equal to H, this is kind of a way of using and, but not using and. So else and then and. So interesting, if you ask me, because I'm not really writing uh, writing down tails or any other and operation, but it still corresponds to that case um, at this point. And I'm assuming, of course, it can only be H and T. So, yeah. So I would then display hats, hats, and then hats, tails, because the else uh, operation here checks for tails. I assume that. And since I have guaranteed that the first one here, if I'm in the else part, the first one would be tails. Therefore, I'm uh, writing tails for the first coin. But since the, uh, the second coin is heads, I have to display that message. And if none of these are satisfied, if the first coin is not heads, if the second coin also is not heads, I'm in this else, and it means that I'm in both of the else uh, statements. It means that the only possible outcome is tails, therefore it should be tails. So this is again if using if and else. 
So let me correct it. But this would be one way of doing things. And it looks a little bit more cleaner and safer for if you, of course, use ELSIF. So let me maybe change it to that. So it should be, of course, ELSIF. And the um, statement should be like this. Uh, of course, we also need ELSIF here. And then we have basically tails. And of course, this should also be else if. Now, this should be the first coin. And then we could also have else for each one, but yeah, it's not really necessary. And let me convert it into individual ifs. So let's actually don't bind them or don't combine them. Just use plain if statements. Same goes for here. Before that, I need to place an end. If, if that's the case, if this is the case, there we go. Now, I have only used if blocks. Here, I also have only used if blocks. They are discrete if blocks. They don't depend on each other. So this is not uh, combined with else here. And the thing that we do is we check for the first coin. If it's heads, then we check for the second coin. If that's also heads, display this message. If it's not, it should be heads and tails. And the inverse goes for here if the first coin is tails, etc., etc. Now, um, yeah, this is basically the solution here. But the thing that I want to point out is the following. If, for example, you are writing a code that in is interested in coins or uh, impossible outcomes and their repetition, then uh, you might face a problem if you have too many coins. So let me actually count them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's say we have six coins and we want to check all the possibilities. At this point, what keeps happening here is that you would add more and more hats here. So it would look like if the third one is hats, the fourth one is that, if the fifth one is that, and if the last one is hat, then we are going to display this. And once you're done with the first option, since we will have two outcomes, two to the power of six would end up in 64 cases. So you have to copy and paste 63 more of the, these, and you have to change them accordingly. And it would go something like this. Just get rid of this part here. You would just say, okay, the last one needs to be tails. And then the next one needs to be tails. And then both of them can be tails. And then you go ahead and copy the whole thing here. And if this is tails, and then you again copy the whole thing here. Now we have tails on this position. So this coin, this one, and this one, this one, this one. And then again, you copy the whole thing. But what keeps happening is that for this case, we are actually changing only uh, one coin copy paste it with uh, it and then change the previous coin and then the previous one until we are done. So we are generating this systematically. Uh, and if you had uh, logic lessons, you get the idea. It is basically the least significant bit and the most significant bit. And we are basically changing uh, one by one. So we generate all the cases without missing anyone, any case. So uh, yeah. And it doesn't really make sense to have all these end operations if you misspell something, if you miss something, if you don't pay attention. It, it doesn't really help here. Uh, this is good for uh, some cases, but not for cases where we have too many coins and if we want to check them all. Instead, what we can do is we can check each coin individually and then copy-paste the whole thing in nestedly. So... What I mean by that is the following. We have checked for the first coin here, and then we are checking for the second coin. 
what we are actually going to do is we are just copying this and paste it here and change it to the third coin. Of course, we still have some copy and paste stuff here, but yeah, we cannot really get rid of that. So we are going to just copy this and say the second coin could be tails. And then, of course, we also take the inverse. But inside of this, we'll just copy it. The messages will change, but the outside should not. So if the first coin is tails, the second coin is heads, the third one is that, it will keep going on like this. Four, five, six. So they will be uh, more organized, in my opinion. So if you use nested loops for these types of uh, event checking, then it would be a little bit more better in my opinion but of course you need a better systematic that determines that or you might want to use uh, some uh, more complicated algorithms than it depends on the algorithm but uh, essentially if you're using if it becomes meaningful to know that there's also a different way of doing things uh, one of them is to use just end operations and deal with the cases individually or break down the whole thing into its subparts and just check one by one and use nested ifs. So, uh, yeah, this was basically about that. Now, um, now we have a for loop and Let's see. In our for loop, we have four x equals one, one, and four. And obviously, we are counting. Display num to str student. Okay. So, if you don't remember what this does, basically, this converts numerical data into string data, like on the right hand side here. So basically, we cannot combine x and student if we don't use num to str. So uh, yeah, we can also use fprintf. There's something called fprintf, which is basically the C version printf. You give it just percentage d and then provide x, and you can do dot student, and it would be the same. Of course, with a new line, you can see it's just printing out that. But it's also possible using this method here, which is more uh, of a MATLAB thing. Uh, and this is more like a, a C-like uh, approach. Well, now, uh, it's a very basic code, but we are requested to convert it into a while loop and then see what's really the difference here. Now, the interesting part here is that the for loop here is not actually a for loop at all. It says it is for, but if you know other programming languages, like for example, C Sharp, or maybe in Python, there's also this mechanism called for each. And this is basically a for each loop. And the reason behind that is the following. If you just uh, copy and paste this part, of the for loop, you'll see that this generates actually an array. So this is nothing but one, two, three, four as an array. And this is a way of incrementally generating series of uh, numbers. For example, you can uh, change the step and you'll be uh, incrementing by two. You have a starting point, an ending point, and that's basically it. Uh, so therefore, this is basically an array, one, two, three, and four. And if you look at this for loop, it's a for each loop because what it does is it defines a dummy variable, takes each element and loops through it. And this is uh, executed for each element in the vector or array. So therefore it's called a for each loop. A, a for loop would be a bit different but that's not really available here in um, 
MATLAB because we always deal with for each loops. So that's that's still a for loop, but you get the idea. In C, what you do is you should just go with int uh, i equals, let's say, one i is less than or equal to, let's say, four, and then i plus plus. This would be a C type for loop. It resembles it when I use this notation here, but it's not quite the same because here we have just one variable. We have a four byte variable in this case. And we're using that and we're incrementing it, whereas we have already a pre-allocated memory of uh, numbers and we are cycling through each element. So it's not quite the same, but it does the same job. Well, now if we want to convert it into a while loop, then it becomes basically the equivalent of a for loop in, in terms of C for loops. So we have to define the variable. You can see we have allocated just maybe a double memory, a memory of double, size double. And then we have another condition that should be satisfied until we are done with the whole thing. And then there is an increment, x should be incremented by one, and we have end. So here the memory that is used is not the same as in here. Uh, so yeah, of course MATLAB uh, would optimize stuff behind the scenes. So I cannot really make the statement at this point. I cannot say that this one is better than this one. It optimizes probably behind the scenes, but uh, semantically, I mean that this should be using less memory. So yeah. Um, yeah, this is basically the equivalent here. And let's try them out. Let's display an empty thing, maybe a string here like this. There we go, both work the same. Of course, it's not really a, a thing to use while loops because most of the time for loops does the job. Uh, and yeah, we don't really want to have an extra statement X. Maybe I'm already using X in another context. So I'm just using a dummy variable in one line. It'll be doing the job. This is more compact and easy to use. So this is probably what we want to use. There's another way of doing this, of course, if I want to be, uh, if I want to use the whole vector thing idea here, I can just loop through each element of x vec and then use the ith element of this x vector. Or you can also be lazy and say x should be the ith element of x vec i and use x. It depends on, uh, on you, uh, upon you. But the thing here is that if I want to use this way of uh, doing it, then I can maybe have another vector, which is just going to be a zeros one by, is it four? I guess four. And I can calculate stuff based on this and just fill out the other vector. So I can use with the uh, same length vectors, multiple same length vectors, and maybe combine the two vectors into one in some mathematical operation and do crazy stuff with it. So I have the indices, therefore I can work with stuff. Let's say this, let's say we are just taking X vec, the element that take the square and store it in Y vec. Now, of course you would argue that, or I would argue that this is not really necessary if you are still use X squared because you can just do X dot squared and it will do it element by element and then you can store that. But that's the power of MATLAB. And yeah, sometimes this becomes still useful. Uh, so that's basically about this. Now, um, what else do we have? Well, here we go. We have a nice uh, example of what I've talked about actually. Now, let's say we have a T vector here, the time vector, obviously. So let me get rid of this. Let's define the time vector. It starts at zero and uh, stops at four times pi. You can just directly use four pi here it will generate to you the vector. And if you're not really happy with this notation, you can use one E minus three. So it's 10 to the power of minus three, or you can use 0 0.01 uh, 
depends on point of view. And then we have xt equals sine t. So yeah, if you are a C, C++ guy, what you would do probably is to define um, a vector first. You take the length and you just create a zeros vector. And then you go in a for loop, i equals up to the length t. And then you just go ahead and equate each element of the x vector here to sine is it 2 pi f, uh, 2 pi it's directly t so uh, you would probably do stuff uh, this way of course it works and let's see of course seeing it will not be easy but yeah we have a time vector we have x vector and it would be if wise to just plot them on the screen. So let's create a figure, let's clear the figure, let's use plot, and plot uses the x-axis versus y-axis, so the x-axis should be time, the y-axis should be x, so we can see the plot. And I like to increase the line width to 2, you can just give it as a key value pair here, and let's see the results. A nice, beautiful sine wave. Uh, so this is our original signal. So we can use that. We can also use hold on and grid on in order to be able to plot on top of each other and then maybe grid on in order to show a nice grid. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's visible, but there is a grid behind the plot. So that's our sine wave. And we are going to uh, pass the signal throughout a rectifier and then compare the results by plotting them. So, of course, there are multiple rectifiers, but it's just the idea, not the whole implementation or how correct it is. But you can go ahead and implement each one of them. So let's have like YR or XR. And it is the same size. Now, what we want to do is uh, we might want to cut off the uh, negative uh, parts of the sine wave. So we just allow the positive ones uh, to go through. That's one way of doing things. And then there's also the absolute value version where all the uh, cycles are on the positive sides. So you can go ahead and look up what a rectifier is if you're not really sure but that's not the point it's just an application so let's assume that we want to have the rectifier which just gets rid of the negative values now of course if i'm going to do that i'm just taking xi here and i need to check if the value is positive for, for instance, let's say positive or equal to zero, greater than or equal to zero. If that's the case, then let's copy the whole thing. Else, if that's, if that's not the case, let's just do nothing at all because it's already by default equal to zero. You can maybe just equate it to zero or you can even skip the else statement, whichever you like. And once we're done with that, we're copying only the positive parts, we're getting rid of the negative parts, we can go ahead and plot that uh, signal on top of each the, on top of the original uh, signal. So in order to distinguish them easier, we can assign them um, colors, let's say black, that stands for K, and maybe let's have red for the next signal. And yeah, that's basically it. So let's go ahead and run it. So there we go. We can see that we got rid of the negative parts and uh, we have cut off the negative parts. So yeah, we can do it in a for loop, take each element, compare if it's positive or not. And based on that, decide if, if we want to copy it or not.
So we can also implement the other one. Let's call it XR2. And here now, if that's uh, if it's positive, we still don't want to change anything. But otherwise, it is negative, so maybe take the inverse. So in that case, the negative values would become positive, and this should have basically the effect that it should. So let's see. And I assigned the blue one. So yeah, let's see. Of course, there might be an issue, but we are still able to see it. Now we can see that the red one is still there. It works. Um, but the blue one overrides basically the first part here because if it's positive, it is positive and it goes for all of them. So we have kind of implemented this rectifier thing here. Now, is it the only way of doing things? This is a more like a C approach here. First of all, do we really need to use a for loop in order to calculate the sign of the whole T vector here? Of course not. So I can get rid of this line, go here and say x is equal to sine t, and it is basically the same. So let me show it to you. Clear, maybe close all, run it. There we go. It's still the same. It still works. And the reason for that is that MATLAB is capable of handling vectors in its mathematical functions. Uh, in the C implementation, you would see that this is a double value, double T, and it returns you double and stuff like that. But here, if you pass a vector to it, it'll just do it element by element and return you the values. So that's one thing. On the other hand, do we really need to do this XR part here by comparing each uh, element of the vector, if it's positive or not, and then decide whether upon it's going to be copied or not? Again, not. You don't really have to do that. Let's get rid of XR here. And of course here. So XR is equal to X where X is greater than or equal to zero. So you can do it in one line, basically. So first of all, let's see if it works. Um, Mm, oh, okay. If I do it like that, it will get rid of the uh, remaining parts. So that's an issue maybe here. Hmm. Um, yeah, I didn't think about that. So let me show you what I'm having as a problem here. If I have something like this, and I want to check if something is greater than or equal to two, it returns me zero, one, one, a logical array. So this comparison is done element by element if, it, if A is a vector. And if it's satisfied, it returns true in terms of logical one. And if not, it returns zero. But the main issue here that we have is that if you pass this, logical array, you can see it shrinks the vector and it eliminates the uh, faults or the not satisfying parts of the vector and returns you just with the uh, results that satisfy. And if I do the same here on the rectifier example, I'm getting rid of basically the parts where we have this uh, zero here. So this part does not satisfy, this part doesn't satisfy, so get rid of them. That's the strategy that is implemented here but what i actually wanted to do is not of course this i wanted to just uh, equate them to zero maybe so let's think about it what happens actually there is a way of doing it and that's the following so let's see a is equal to that a is greater than or equal to zero so what i can do is i can convert this into a double so now it's not a logical array, it's just zeros and ones. And 
if I multiply element by element, you'll see that this one will be equal to zero. Otherwise, it will not change the value. So this is kind of a filter now. And if I multiply them element by element, I'll get the effect. I'll just set zero equal to zero, whatever is that doesn't satisfy in the vector. But I'm not changing anything that satisfies the condition that I'm trying to check here. So and that can be done via doing the following. X dot times. So dot times or dot divided is a element wise operation because we are dealing with matrices. You can't do this. It's not possible to do this because this is a, a legit multiplication problem. If this is a one by three matrix, you cannot multiply a one by three with the one by three matrix. What you can do, of course, take one of the vectors and take their transpose. But if you do that, for example, on the sec second one, you'll end up with scalar multiplication. So it's going to just multiply element by element and then sum them up. That's not the effect that I'm after. If you do it uh, the other way around, then you'll generate a matrix, which is also not what I want. I want to multiply these vectors element by element and end up in the same vector size. So therefore, I need to use, as it suggests you, to use dot multiplication. That will perform an element-wise multiplication rather than a matrix multiplication. So that's important to note here. So therefore, x or, uh, will be multiplied element by element with double x greater than or equal to zero. And that should do the trick. Now it did uh, do the trick because you see that there are zeros here and then the remaining parts are like this. Now, if we want to do it the hard way, what we can do for XR2, of course, what we can do is we can take this and maybe add also this part here, but then we have X times uh, or X element wise times double X less than zero. And then again, times minus one should actually do the trick, I guess. So I'm basically taking the positive parts, multiply it with this filter of one of zero, one and zeros. So this would represent the positive part, the first one, the third one here. But then I have also the inverse operation here. I'm uh, basically getting these uh, negative parts and then I'm multiplying that with the filter and then multiply it with minus one in order to change them so that they are positive. And if I sum them together, I should get the same result. So I'm going to get rid of this and see if it's working now. And as you can see, nothing almost changed. Of course, uh, this is still not the final thing because in line six, I have overcomplicated stuff. I have chosen the positive or uh, equal to zero once. I have uh, set everything else to zero. That's the first part. And then I have also chosen the negative ones, uh, chose them, uh, set e uh, everything equal to zero other than this, and then multiply it with minus one and then sum them together to get this effect. But do I really have to have to do that? Of course not. You can just go ahead and take the absolute value of x because it's basically the same. Uh, why? Because it will take each element, take the absolute value, and that's exactly what we are after. Let me comment this out. There we go, it still works. It's still the same solution. You can also combine these plots into a one line plot, and etc. So it, it, it can get more compact than this. But yeah, you get the idea. It's just about demonstration. You don't really have to use a MATLAB, uh, for loops or stuff like that in MATLAB uh, because, well, if you know MATLAB well, it has some capabilities which are sometimes even faster than you expect. So uh, yeah, that's basically it. Now, um, here we have again the same 
if you want to calculate the RMS value of this, for example, let's take XR2 and try to uh, calculate the RMS value of that. Uh, the formula actually helps us out here. Um, what we have to do is we have to take individual squares, sum them up, and that's the first part. Let's do that. Uh, yeah. So we need to take squares. You can again code it with a for loop for i1 up to length i i equals one length of t or x or xr2 whatever and and then go ahead and take the signals if element take the square and then have a sum here and then add this to the sum sum equals sum plus this and once you're done you can go ahead and take the square root of the sum divided by the length of xr so that would be basically the implementation if you are in C. That should be it. So let's run it. 0 0.707, which is expected squared divided by two, is the RMS value of the sine wave. There we go. But again, you don't really have to do it. You have to just focus on the element wise operation here, which is this one. So what I can do is I can just take the element wise square here. There we go. You can also plot it maybe if you're excited about that, but yeah. Um, by the way, it's not of a sine wave, the RMS value here because it's rectified, so yeah. Um, so what we then have to do, since this is a vector, is to get the whole sum. And there is something called sum. It works on uh, vectors. It is the sum of the elements of the vector x, which is convenient. There's also the products, I guess. It takes the product of the elements. So if you are lazy and don't want to use for loops, which you should, by the way, uh, avoid to use for loops whenever possible, because it's uh, way more optimized this way. So we can just directly go ahead and take the sum, divide it into the length of xr, and then take the square root because it's a scalar number at this point. It's not a vector at all. There we go. It's the same. And it's a one-line thing. And you can also, uh, I'm going to show you something. You can also uh, define a function in one line, which is called a lambda function in most programming language, and which is also available in, in MATLAB here. You can go ahead and say RMS equals, and then an at, which is kind of a pointer or the address of the function pointer, if you know what I mean. And then you provided a certain vector, let's say xr2 in this case, or let's call it x. So this way I have actually defined a function, a one-line function. So let me show you. So if you call RMS, it says that it's a function handle with value that, which means that you can go ahead and use it as a function. What is the RMS value of xr2? It's point that. What is the RMS value of XR? It's 0.5. What is the RMS value of X itself? It's again 0.707. So that's basically a function now, and you can use it and use it uh, over and over again. Of course, you can also define a function called RMS here as a, as a separate script file, and then copy and paste the insides of it and do it. But sometimes you want to just have a one-line function, a lambda function that will just serve a certain purpose and then it's not going to be used anywhere else. So you can do it like this. So now the peak value, of course, is also not really that hard. We have a function called max and you can just directly get the peak value out of it. So it's quite easy. The reason why we have a question about this is that you can go ahead and implement it with for length x and then have a last max or something like that and then have it equal to negative infinity for example if the x i element is greater than or maybe also equal to last max then the last max 
is equal to this element. Otherwise, we don't do anything else. So you're just cycling through each element. You look for your last max. I have just placed minus infinity. You can place something else. Doesn't really matter. But it is kind of tricky to come up with a nice value. What we most of the time do in applications is that either we have um, the standard infinity definition on our hardware. If we are using a floating point double uh, type of thing, it has its maximum negative value. Then we use that. Or we just define it with a statement like define and give it a value. And we know what the value is. So we are cautious about that. Or um, as it is here in MATLAB, we already have the term infinity or not a number. So we can use that in order to do, uh, deal with uh, such problems here. Uh, once we've done with that, we just look if it's a greater value. If it is, just assign it. If not, then go on. So that's basically it. But you don't really have to reinvent the wheel because it is already already available to you. You can just use max. And if you don't remember what it does, it gives you this. Uh, the maximum of a vector, even a matrix, it gives you the row or column. I'm not really sure about that, where it exists, but this is basically it. And there's another usage which I want to show you. It can be used like this. And this becomes handy sometimes. If you want to know the value, that's uh, okay. But you might also want to know which element is the maximum value. Uh, then you can go ahead and use it. So it will return you that information. So let's come up with something that... Or maybe I should show it to you with an example. Five and a four, three, two. Maybe something like that. If you copy and paste it, index, the value is five and its index coincidentally is also five. It's this one here, that's the maximum. So you might want to use the index for some reason. So that's that. Well, now we have two more things, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so we can go ahead and finish it and then just, uh, yeah, conclude the lesson for today. Now, write a function named plot sine, which plots a sine wave in the following form. And the function should accept t, a, and f as arguments. So this is not really that difficult. So what we have to do is we just take the name, create a script, go ahead and think about the usage of this. So how would I call a function named plot sine? Well, I would use parentheses. My arguments are called T, A, and F. So T, A, and F would be a good thing to have. And then it will basically return nothing at all because it's a plot function. I don't want to return anything. I just want to use it. So once you have decided on the usage, what you can do is just call it function and and, and you're good to go. Now, uh, yeah, we want to plot a sine wave that looks like this. So first of all, we have t. So it means that t uh, can be used to calculate it. So a stands for amplitude, of course. Then sine 2 times pi times f times t. And of course, what we do is we will plot it t, comma x. Maybe increase the line width here to 2. And that should be basically it. Now, as for the application itself, let's have that. Um, we can open up a figure, hold on to it, grid on. Now, once you have that, you can just say plot sign and T, let's say amplitude should be equal to one and the frequency should be, I don't know, maybe one for now. So let's see if it works. Of course it does. Now the interesting thing about this is the following. You can use a for loop and let's say the frequency should start with one, increase with 0.2 up to maybe three, something like that. And then pass in the frequency here. 
and observe what happens. Yeah, it's not really that um, visible, but if we zoom in, for example, we see the sort of effect here, uh, especially here maybe, that if we increase the frequency, oh, we don't know which way it is, but uh, it should be uh, to the left, because if we eat, uh, increase the frequency, the period uh, uh, is the inverse, so it will, uh, so if we increase the frequency, it should be a faster signal to sum it up. So the more cycles you see, the faster the signal should be, so the higher the frequency is, basically. Uh, but of course, the amplitude is also possible, so I'm just going to be lazy and call it one, but the amplitude is this one here. So you can toy around with it and you can see, okay, the amplitude is actually the amplitude. So the maximum value just keeps increasing. And that's basically it. Or what you might want to also do is to change the plot sign function a little bit and say, I also want to have some sort of a face and I'm going to add it to here. Um, don't forget that that's in radians. So we need to add the face here. So I'm not really sure if it's going to work, but yeah, it does. So it shifts the signal to, uh, yeah, with with the face that is added to the signal. So it's uh, possible to toy around with this. Um, and keep in mind that I didn't give any color data because it will just update its color. The more you call plot, the uh, different or the, the, the color will change based upon your calls. But there's a, a sad thing about that uh, because as far as I remember, there are like 10 or 15 colors and it will cycle through. So yeah, that's not, uh, sometimes it's not enough. Well, the last but not least example of today will be to write a function called numeric derivative, which calculates the following, which is the definition of a numeric derivative, where the function accepts t and x as arguments, t is the sampling time, and this function returns the derivative here. So let's call this numeric derivative dot m. Now this time our function takes the time vector, I guess, and the signal to take the derivative. And that's basically it, but it will return the derivative. So it should be something like this because it will return the derivative. Now, therefore we'll call it a function and that should be it. So now let me close this one here. Let's get rid of that and maybe also that. So we have that, so let's have the sine of t. And then we're calling uh, x the numeric derivative and then uh, t comma x, I guess. Yeah, t comma x. So that's it. Now, if you look close to the definition, what it does is it does the following. Since we are on a computer and we are using the computer to uh, hold some values and vectors, here kt and k plus 1t refers to actually samples or directly to the elements of a vector. It means that uh, if k is the current element you're interested in, k plus one is the next element. So you should take the next element, the current element, take the difference, divide it to the time difference between the samples. Uh, because there's a t, uh, capital T jump between the time values, since this is xt, depending on t, but t is discrete. So if you think about it, k starts from one up to length, of t at this point so it's here and what we try what 
this tries to tell us is that if k is equal to one, for example, you should take two. And this capital T is just the sampling time. So it means that uh, the first one value, kt and k plus one t, if this is uh, one, if k is equal to one, then this is basically t. The next one is two t. The next one is three t. And it goes on like that. And if you look close here, the first two elements actually reveal what capital T is because time starts at zero. And the second one, so if that starts at zero, you can just add zero. And the second one here, or the increment in this case, is actually the assembling time itself. So we can just use this here, take the second time, and take the previous one, take the difference that is going to be your sampling time. It is the difference between time, time instances, basically. And here we are defining the sampling time directly because time starts at zero. But you don't really have to use two and one. You can also use three and two, um, 30 and 29, whatever, two consecutive time instances and their difference. That's what we are interested in, nothing else. But I'm going to stick with this. And what you have to do is you have to go to the vector take two consecutive elements out of it, take their difference, divide it into capital T, and that's basically the approximation for your numerical derivative. So that's basically it. Now, let me just take the sampling time, put it in here, because we will be provided a time vector, otherwise it doesn't make sense. So therefore, if we have the sampling time, the only thing that we have to do is we have to, for example, calculate x2 minus x1 divided by capital T. And do this, repeat this for the whole vector. So x3 minus x2, etc., etc. once the vector is done. So how can we do that? Well, xd should be equal to a, a vector. Let's call it zeros. By the way, sometimes I use one and length t, but a lazier version would be to use directly the size function. It will it just take the size of t and pass it to the function that generates the vector, and it will copy the size, but the elements will be equal to zero. You can just directly use that. So if you use size t, you'll see that it returns 1, 1257 in this case. So it'll be passed to zeros, so you can go ahead and generate the vector like this. So now we will have a for loop and k should start uh, at one up to length, let's say t. And since this is the operation that we are interested in, and this should be somehow xd or the kth element of xd, um, this is the current one k, this is the next one, and this is basically it in this case. We have calculated what the sampling time is. We have allocated a memory for xd. We are taking the difference for each of them. Now, here we have an issue, a slight issue. Namely, the length t is the length t, in this case, 1257, I guess. And if k is equal to 1257, and if you're looking for k plus 1, that would be 1258, there is no element corresponding to this number. So we don't have this index. So it will be indexed out of range, kind of an exception type thing. So therefore, we should stop somewhere here, because k plus 1 can be at max 1257. So we should stop at the previous value 1257, so we can add 1. So the last operation would look like 1256. So therefore, we should start uh, stop uh, at that. But then the issue is that xd, the last element of xd, is empty. It's going to be 0, and we'll see it in a minute. So that's hopefully it. Let's go ahead and take the derivative, which we do here. Let's open up the figure back. 
uh, and plot the original signal. Add the derivative. There we go. Now we have calculated the um, derivative. You can see that since that was a sine wave, we kind of get the cosine wave. It makes sense. But the issue here is at the end of the signal, the red one here, it goes straight down to zero. And that's not because it is going to zero, because the last element itself is uh, equal to zero. So there are two ways of solving this. One way is to just repeat the last value. That's one solution, because it's a derivative and it's numeric. Uh, and the time jump here is the sampling time. It doesn't really matter if your, uh, if your value is repeated, because the time difference here is 0 0.001. So it's not really that big of a deal. You can just repeat the last value in order to have a more aesthetic output. And that would be that would look like this. You would just say, okay, whatever length uh, of t is, whatever the last element is, just copy the value from the previous one, minus one. And if we do that, let's see. You can see it is gone. It looks more continuous. And it doesn't really matter if just a slight little uh, repetition is going on because you can see the time instances. The difference is 10 to the power of minus 3. So it's not really important at all. Um, yeah, the only restriction here is that the sampling time should be as low as possible. And if your signal on its own, if you think about this, has a, a sampling rate that's not really uh, high, then what you might uh, want to do is just uh, upsample your uh, signal and then look for the numeric derivative and then downsample it. But that's too much detail, so you get the point. By the way, I don't really have to use length t. I can just say end. It will correspond to the same thing. And end minus 1 would be the previous one. It still works this way. You can just use end and end minus 1 uh, for a shortcut. Now, um, yeah, this is basically it for this week. You can see that I have basically all the answers in my PDF, and I will upload this PDF, so you will be uh, accessing these ones. Um, and that's pretty much it for today.